Hello, Will Self isn't a writer with a profile problem. He published his first collection of short stories at the beginning of the decade to immediate acclaim. And since then, he's attracted praise and opprobrium in roughly equal measure. His presence is everywhere. As well as his fiction, he appears frequently on television and is a prolific journalist. His image is that of the bad lad of the literary and media worlds, shocking, experimental, and unashamedly drug-influenced. Indeed, he was famously fired by The Observer when he was accused of taking heroin on John Major's plane during last year's election campaign. David Thomas's film is about the writer behind the hype and the headlines. Shot literally over the length of Britain, it's a journey into the weird and parallel worlds of Will Self. You know, if Anthony Pohl wrote the dance to the music of time, I'm writing the sort of ecstatic, intoxicated gibber to the music of time in that way, or even to the music of space rather than time. And uh, that's been the sense of the project, I suppose, that sense of creating an, an interleaved fictional world. Can we have a big welcome, please, for the one and only Hannah, four words, four letters, four letters, for yourself. And he's a big sort of, sort of lens, and Johnny sort of leans over, he's, you know, he's, he's very intense, and that's the first impression, but he's big, and I mean, as you get to know him, you realise he's got a constitution like an ox, too, and he's physically very strong. I mean, he can sort of take vast quantities of substances that most people are, will just crash on. Uh, and even if he wilts a bit physically, <laughs> his mind almost sparks. I mean, you can be almost drooling with drink and drugs or something, and everything he says is, is coherent and frighteningly so sometimes. design faults in the Volvo 760 Turbo. <laughs> One, instruments and controls. Welcome to the terrifyingly tiny world of the urban adulterer. Bill Bywater has been snogging with a woman called Serena giving and receiving as much tongue as possible. As he, snogged, he finds it hard to write an unuphonious sentence, but perhaps more than the prose, it's, it's the density of the imagination that he does. You know, once embarked on a flight, he does, um, he really does see it through and lives it completely on the page. His wife, Vanessa, cycles home every evening along Sussex Gardens at more or less this time. It is not unlikely that Vanessa will see Bill snogging with Serena because Bill is, he acknowledges with a spurt of dread, at least 60 feet high. He bestrides the two lanes of bumpy tarmac, his crotch forming a blue denim underpass for the coursing traffic. Vanessa will be able to see in this colossus of roads. The very instant <laughs> she jolts across the intersection of the Edgware Road and commences peddling down Sussex Gardens, caught bang to rights, caught snogging with this slapper. What could he do with Serena short of hiring a room in the Lancaster Hotel? For half an hour, no, that would show up on his credit card statement. And the Volvo 760 Turbo was out of the question on account of various design faults. London tends to be the place where I cite most of my narratives. I tend to view the place as, you know, as a giant hallucinogenic fungus. And in a way, I've always found it much easier to realise London in isolation. You know, I suppose coming up to Orkney, I've got a, a sort of deficit of imagination here. I mean, perhaps that's why I feel my own imagination rather firing up when I get here and other worlds mutating out, out of my own mind. Orkney was like Avalon, a mystical place where beyond the rampart cliffs of Hoy, a shoal of green whale-like islands basked in the azure sea. It was one of the things Bill loved most about the far north. Professional middle-class friends down south would have no sense of the geography of these regions. When he told them he had a cottage in Orkney, they would insistently confuse the islands with the Hebrides. 
It allowed Bill to feel that in a very important way, once the St. Olaf ferry pulled out of Scrabster Harbour, he was sailing off the face of the earth. I come and stay in this house, which belongs to uh, a friend of mine, and I didn't really have much of an idea of where Orkney was until I got here. And it has a feeling of its own mondial quality. It's a world within a world in that way. I think that's very appealing to somebody who deals with creating fictional world. I tend to spend my time here very much in isolation, so I suppose it represents the isolation that's necessary for me to work on a text, to really bring a text to completion, and I've tended to finish books here. That's been the role that's played for me, is to, is to come up here and absolutely immerse myself in the text. Sometimes for 16 or more hours a day, so that I feel myself absolutely within the phenomenology of the text. So that you uh, eat, sleep and dream it. I do genuinely believe that the presence of large quantities of water has an impact on the imagination and I think the imagination responds, especially in sleep, to the presence of uh, tidal movements and currents of water. And here, where you have an enormous sound of quickly moving water outside at night I think the uh, the dreaming faculty goes quite crazy I mean I would certainly find it uh, very very important to experience those kinds of dreams which fade so slowly after waking that you're left feeling ontologically queasy for a long time you're not quite sure what's dream and, and what's reality and that's the feeling you very much get here that the sleep is that profound and the water is moving that much. Cancer tore through her body as if it were late for an important meeting with a lot of other successful diseases. After Mother died, we arranged things conventionally but austerely. Her corpse was burnt at Golders Green Crematorium. When I stopped seeing fake mothers on the street, I reckoned that I'd just about accepted her death which made the events that transpired even more shocking. I was walking down Crouch Hill towards Crouch End when, coming up the other side of the road, I saw Mother. Mother, I said, what are you doing in Crouch End? You never come to Crouch End except to take the cat to the vet. You don't even like Crouch End. Well, I live here now. Mother was unperturbed. I wrung it out of her eventually. When you die, you move to another part of London where you resume pretty much the life you had before you died. There are lots of dead people in London and quite a few dead businesses. When you've been dead for a few years, you're encouraged to move to the provinces. The North London Book of the Dead, which uh, you know, concerns the, the narrator meeting his, his dead mother walking up a hill in Crouch End, is, the, is, in a sense, the only nakedly autobiographical thing I've ever written, in that the, the, the character of the mother is very much based on my mother. One of the great sadnesses of, of my adult life is that my mother died before I had anything professionally published. Were you encouraged to write uh, when you were young enough to remember and it, for it to be important to you? Well, I think I was, you see, and I think that that makes me feel quite odd about, about the whole business. I was actually trained in many ways to be a writer by my parents and it's a, it's an odd feeling why did they, how I did, feel now yeah yeah how did they do it and why did they do it well first they, of all why did they do it I think they noticed that I had a good turn of phrase when I was very young I was a small precocious child and a lot of my parents set great store by verbal by rhetoric and by well not so much by rhetoric by verbal dexterity and skill and you got marks for that Good marks from your, both your parents for that. Well, not particularly. I mean, it was quite exacting, and with reason, you see. I mean, I think, uh, in a sense, you know, it's, it's, it's either death or birth that often makes a writer, and I certainly think that my mother's death, which I, as it were, honoured with my own creative debut, 